one of the outstanding duties and privileges and joys of the Christian life is to be on speaking terms with God. It's the Father's desire and will that His children speak to Him. That is, that they pray to Him. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you word. We often speak on the importance of studying the Bible. That's God speaking to us. We labor to teach the importance of handling a right, a right and dividing word of truth as we give diligence to understand it, 2 Timothy 2.15. We recognize that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, whether it's the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, or the Christian dispensation, so the prophet Hosea said. Paul would say at times in his writing that I would not have you ignorant, meaning without knowledge, brethren. So there is the great growth in knowledge that comes by study, but in studying the Bible, we see the importance of prayer. We see that God wants us to know that his, his, as His children, we are on speaking terms with Him. We studied last week how that God is not ashamed of us and that we don't have to stand the shame before Him, that we are the friends of God, that we are truly His children, made so by our belief and obedience to the gospel and from, from the heart being baptized in obedience to it into Christ for the remission of sins. The Lord adding us to the church, which is the family of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. And Paul told Timothy in that passage that there was a certain way to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. One of those things is, is that we learn how to pray, and we see the need of it. If you're going to be faithful, there are at least two things that's got to be regular in your life. The study of the Bible, where God speaks to you and informs you of your duty to Him, of His promises, of His blessings, even of His warnings if we don't serve Him correctly but then our speaking to Him. And I don't know why we as children, or so few of us in this world, always has been so few who really were faithful to God, why we do not want to draw near with holiness under the throne of grace. As the writer of Hebrews continued to say, that we may receive mercy and find grace, favor to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16. So it should give us joy and satisfaction to know that the prayers, that is the supplications of a righteous man, availeth much. James 5 verse 16. Sometimes people ask, well, how much is much? The easiest answer I can give you to that is, it's more than a little. It simply says that God listens to his faithful children's prayers when they are asking faithfully of him those things they have a right to ask of him and that he wants them to ask of him. Looking at what the Bible says, and of course we'll just be giving a cursory study of very important points, I think, though there are few in this sermon. Think about Christ who was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, so the writer of Hebrews said. But when you look at the account of his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that Christ prayed much. 
And the fact that he spent time in prayer is great positive proof that Christians must be praying disciples. But how often do we let a day slip by and we never think of him in the sense of speaking to him? And yet it should be a part of our everyday life. As we look through uh, briefly the life of Christ concerning prayer, we see that at the beginning of our Lord's public ministry, immediately following when he obeyed John's baptism, he prayed, Luke 3 and 21. Then on the night before Jesus selected the twelve, Scripture simply says he went out into the mountains to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 6 and verse 12. Matthew tells us this in Matthew 14 and verse 23. And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when even was come, he was there alone. Continuing on through his life and his prayers, we read in Mark 1 in verse 35, And in the morning, a great while before day, he rose up and went out and departed into a desert place and there prayed. Continuing, you come to the conclusion of our Lord's life toward the end of it. And you see the parting message that he had for his apostles. And he lifted up his eyes to heaven and prayed. John chapter 17. And a little later than that, not long before he was arrested... Remember, he took Peter, James, and John and went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Scripture tells us he prayed three times there, Matthew 26, verses 36 through 44. And then, of course, the picture of Christ being crucified as the Scriptures and word pictures describe it, even on the cross. Our Lord prayed, Luke 23, 34 through 46. So we see Christ living a sinless life, tempted in every point like as we are. And when you consider the closeness of Christ with his heavenly Father, remember he said, I do always those things that please him. He had to center his mind on things spiritual. He kept his body from sinning. He kept his mind from sinning. I think sometimes we very definitely get the idea that there's no problem with Christ. He was God in the flesh. How could he sin? Well, I guarantee you the devil sure thought he could sin. And how could he really win over us without undergoing what we readily undergo, but we fail all of sin to come short of the glory of God? Romans 3.23, sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. But Christ as a man overcame Satan and never sinned. That's just an amazing thing. Not one thought ever crossed his mind that transgressed his father's will. Not one word ever left his mouth that was wrong. Those are an amazing things. And prayer... He is speaking to his Father. I do always those things that please him. Should teach us as children of God through faith in Christ the importance of prayer. Of course it demands that we have the kind of trust, faith, belief that he answers prayer. I don't know what people do who have no concept of God. What do they do? I think of the atheist who says there's nothing spiritual. There is no God. What does he do? All he can do is tell himself 
when hardships come along or even when he's enjoying great things. When the end comes, I just cease. When Alexander Campbell was getting ready to debate Robert Owen, who was the great atheist of his day, Owen came to Campbell's farm in Bethany, what is now West Virginia, and they were walking across the farm for he came to discuss the debate and getting ready for it. And Owen was bragging about atheists to Campbell as they strolled along over the farm, and he said, uh, you know, we atheists have no fear of death. Meaning, of course, there's no spiritual afterlife. There's nothing. We just cease to be. Campbell's response, I thought, was a good one. He says, you see that ox over there standing in the shade? He's content to stand there and chew his could and whisk away the flies with his tail. He has no fear of death, but neither does he have any hope of eternal life. And that makes all the difference in the world. So what does an atheist do, an infidel? When times are good, does he thank anybody? When times are bad, has he got somebody to turn to? I think if they were as honest as honesty demands they be, they would probably find themselves praying. <laughs> they just wouldn't let you know about it. Because there is instilled in us by our Creator a spirit made in his own image that cries out for something else. There's a yearning there. And in the child of God, in all that that means in the scriptures, there's a desire to speak to the Father. Think of the songs that we sing all the time. Many of them are nothing but prayer set to music. Many of them are, are, are expressing ourselves in song of a longing. Songs we sang this afternoon, a longing to be at home with God. Oh, Beulah land. That's yearning for heaven. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful line, a Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Think if people can't sing that. People outside the church, people unfaithful, people who aren't children of God, they can sing it, but since they haven't obeyed the gospel, not Christians, it goes no higher in their head. The early church was, was, was strong in what we have in the scriptures in prayer and in thanksgiving. In speaking of those 3,000 on the day of Pentecost that were added to the church, Luke says that they continued steadfastly. He gives a list. And he says in that list is in prayers, Acts 2, 41 and 42. Steadfastly in prayers. There was a regularity to their prayer. If you go back to Daniel, those people that got him thrown in the lion's den, they knew that he would pray and they knew what time of day he would pray because he had that schedule that he was going to pray. And though the king said no, he knew he would and they knew he would and that's why they got him into trouble, which turned out, of course, God saving him from that den of the lions. The lions found themselves in a den of one Daniel. God closed their mouths. They did nothing. Now, what do you get out of that when you read it that helps you as a member of the church? Well, it ought to be that God's with us. He's not working miracles today, but he's with us. Why should we think that it, before God can deal with in the affairs of this world, which by his word he brought it into existence and by his word he keeps it going. Why should we think that it just takes a miracle before God can act in this world? He upholds all things by the word of his power. Praying to God for things, God can work. I don't know how he can do things. Here's a person who's very, very ill. And we pray for them. Let me ask you this. If all the doctors he consulted or she consulted, as the case may be, were to say, there's no hope for this person. There's nothing can be done for it. Would you stop praying for it? You know there's, there's at least one reason I wouldn't stop praying for that person. Doctors aren't omniscient. 
<laughs> They're just not. And there's things they might even discover that would uh, cure the person. And I trust in God. I'm taught to have that kind of trust. So are you and is every child of God. When um, Paul was kept in prison by Herod, the scripture says that prayer was made earnestly of the church unto God for him, I should say, Peter. Why? Have you ever wondered what they were praying? Well, you know, he took James. Herod didn't kill him. That's the reason he arrested Peter. See, people like that. Killed James, brother of John, with a sword. So he take Peter. Well, I wonder if they were praying, help him to bear up under this, help him to face his execution in faithfulness, strengthen him to face this ordeal. They were surprised when he was knocking at the door. You ever notice that? Surprised poor old Rhoda so much. She didn't open the door to let him in. She ran back in and said, Peter's there knocking at the door. Well, what have they been praying for? I don't know. But I really wonder, were they praying that he'd been let loose? Because they've been taught over and over again to be willing to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. But they prayed. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, Paul wrote in Romans 12 and verse 12. To the church of God in Corinth, he says, Give yourselves unto prayer, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. To the faithful in Christ in the city of Ephesus, with all prayer and supplications, praying in all seasons in the Spirit, and watching thereunto in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, Ephesians 6, 18. For all the saints. Do you pray for the saints in India and Africa and Europe and Asia? You know, you don't have to know them to pray for them. You don't, to have, you don't have to have met them, been introduced to them, before you pray for them. Some reason or another, we, we see one another here, and that's good. We have this fellowship that God intended that we ought to have because we're with one another. But spiritually, we're all over the world. Christians are in the church because the Lord added us to the church. Any Christian in Africa, I'm in the same church that person's in. And that person and we are together and all Christians in the same church Paul's in, Peter was in. The ones that were added to the church on the day of Pentecost, the church began, we're all in that church. They're our brethren. We ought to be praying for them. To the church at Philippi, Paul wrote in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your request be made known unto God, Philippians 4, 6. Another one, the church at Colossae continues steadfastly in prayer, watching therein with all thanksgiving, Colossians 4, verse 2. And then to the church in Thessalonica, pray without ceasing, everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you, Word, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. As I said, this is just a cursory reading, looking at the life of Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, now looking at the early church. But look how much is given in those few words to the importance of prayer in your life and my life. The last uh, three that we mention here, passages, show the close interrelation of prayer and thanksgiving. You hardly can read about prayer without reading about thanksgiving. And here's why. It's what James wrote. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1, verse 17. You get a job, like we talked about this morning, thank God for it. Whatever happens in your life, 
do you thank God for? Remember one of the marks of the apostasy of the Gentiles, the human race from God in Romans 1 was they became unthankful. Now you watch people who are, it's all about them. They're living for themselves. And you'll find out they're not very thankful. To receive these blessings from God without ever thanking Him is to not be much ahead of the hogs who might eat the corn thrown out on the ground, but they never look up to see where it came from. And of course, our Lord is the example, the pattern to follow when it comes to giving thanks for food. Do you regularly, before you eat your meal, have a prayer to thank God for it. We ought to. If you're by yourself somewhere, does that mean you can't pray to God? <laughs> Certainly you can pray silently to God. I hope you can. I'd hate to know we have to be where we have to stop and bow our heads before we can pray. There's been a number of times over the years where I've been here and there and going yonder and I prayed. <laughs> I prayed we get through this. We'd be able to come through it, withstand it, be successful, whatever it might be. I'm glad we can pray anytime, anywhere. Prayers don't have to be two hours long before they're prayed to God. I suggest that you go over to the model prayer, read it deliberately and out loud, and see how long it takes for you to cover it. And yet everything's covered in that prayer by Jesus that one need to pray for. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for specifics and call names. I think we ought to. But I'm talking about what the general coverage of prayer in the model to follow that Jesus gave is there. And if you look through all these other passages in the scriptures pertaining to prayer, you will see it touches on every one of those general points that Christ gave us in the model prayer. The great thing that I like about all of this, because I'm a human and I need it, is that God's promised to answer prayers. But those promises are conditional. James said, ye ask, speaking to Christians, ye ask and receive not, James 4, 3. Well, I always ask the question, Why? James has written to brethren who heard the gospel, believed it, obeyed it, were added to the church by the Lord, worshipped scripturally and so forth. Why did he say that to them? And I know James has written concerning Christian conduct. Well, let's look at a few reasons why their prayers were probably not acceptable. We're taught that our lives must be righteous. Righteous simply defined as right doing. I don't know how to be right in whatever I do except that I know the teaching of the Lord and thus what he's authorized me to do is right. That's how I'm righteous. And the Bible says, according to Peter, again writing to Christians, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears unto their supplication. We're taught, and I realize some overlapping here, we're taught to be obedient. He's the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him. And we have then 1 John 3, 22, where John actually addresses members of the church on that very point. And whatsoever we ask, listen how positive he is. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. If there's any one verse you remember this afternoon out of all of them, remember that one. I pointed out that prayer is conditional. We receive things of him as we humble ourselves and do his will. I hope we would know we shouldn't pray to him if we didn't really have belief, trust in him that he can answer it and will answer it. Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Well, when he says believing, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, he doesn't mean we can just ask anything. 
but we ask it in harmony with the word of God. That's what it means to do it in faith. The faith must be confident. It must be an obedient faith. We must have an attitude toward our fellow man, toward our brethren. There must be a spirit that says, even this person who's in sin and hard-hearted and rebellious, if he repents and I'll do what I can to get him to repent, or she, as the case may be, I'm ready to forgive him. Jesus said, but if you give not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses, Matthew 6, 15. So there's like, like God, God stands ready to forgive. I don't care how many, the most wicked people you can think of on this earth, God's ready to forgive them. Paul called himself chief of sinners, meaning that if I can get forgiveness, you can. But it's all dependent upon your attitude toward God, His Word, and obedience to the gospel. We're also taught to abide in Christ. We sing songs along that line too, don't we? In John 15, 7, Christ is speaking to his apostles relative to their work. They were the closest to him on earth. And he said, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Well, again, that was particularly applied to them as apostles, but the principle's the same. If you ask in faith, you have to ask because the Word of God teaches you you've got the right and the privilege and the obligation to ask. And then you believe God, then He'll do it. It's ridiculous to get up here and just mutter prayers. Well, what did old brother so-and-so uh, say in his prayers? He led us to pray. I don't know. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, that shows us in our worship. Sometimes we need to discipline our minds and train our minds to listen to those that are leading us in prayer and follow the lead. I've seen people say, I, I get a bit amused sometimes when we have some of the Spanish, it doesn't happen all the time, some of the Spanish brethren around, we have prayer in English, we'll have prayer in Spanish, and I've listened several times when the Spanish are over, the people who can't speak a word of Spanish don't know what he said, but maybe a word or two, they'll say amen. <laughs> Uh, when you go into the Bible, we're not supposed to be able to say, so be it, what that fellow said. Unless what? We can understand it. <laughs> I, I, you, know, you never know what some people are praying for. Doesn't mean I distrust people, but we ought to understand the point is what the person is saying. In James 4, 3, you ask, this ties back into what we began with, you ask, and receive not. Well, these are Christians. They were asking and they weren't receiving. He tells them why. Because you ask amiss. We got that far in what I read in the beginning. But here's the rest of it. That ye may spend it on your lust. Or American Standard says in your pleasures. Well, they got a new car down here. They're giving it away. And I'm praying that I get that car. They've got this, that, or the other, or whatever. What are you going to do with that car? Well, I'll have a bunch of fun with it. Well, don't think the Lord's going to give you that. If that's not the kind of thing he's talking about here, you give me a commentary on what he means. <laughs> that's what it means to ask according to his will. I remember the old story that was told me back as a young preacher about a lady who had children, and this happened many times more, many, 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 many years ago than we realize today because of the abundance that we have, but a lot of folks just didn't have much, and they really wondered from day and day to the next where their food was coming from. No screens on the windows, the windows up, and this woman was praying for food on her table. She was bowed at her table, and two old boys, as boys can be, walked by and heard her, and they listened. And she was praying for food. Did she find some food? They said, let's give her some food. So they slipped off and actually got her some groceries and brought them. She's still in supplication and prayer. And they slip it in and set it down, and they 
went out until she quit and she got through praying and there was that food. She began to thank the Lord for the food and the boys thought that was hilarious. So they poked their head in the window and said, we brought you that food. She said, well, I was praying to God for it, but it didn't mean he wouldn't use two devils to bring it to me. God can overrule anything. God can work through anything. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 1 John 5, 14. Now, why are those words written? When I read those, I'm a Christian. John wrote them the Christians. They're part of the Lord's will. He wants us to know that if we do our part, we're faithful, we're righteous, then he hears us. There's no use praying if we don't intend to do his will. It's kind of a hit or miss thing, stopgap measure. I realize that in times past, people have gotten beside themselves over the physical posture of the one in an assembly or even at home, maybe, when they lead a prayer. You might not know it, but 100 years ago, it was customary for the one who came to the front to lead a prayer publicly to actually bow down at their knees. I've seen a little of that. It was still a little around when I was young. Brother G.K. Wallace told me one time, he said he did not, after he was preaching a meeting somewhere when he was a young man, this goes back to the 20, 1920, so it's almost 100 years ago, he said, he said they did it and he didn't follow the custom. Said uh, he stood there and bowed his head and led the prayer and they were dismissed. Said he didn't get out the back door. This old man came up to him all upset. Said, you did not kneel down when you prayed. Brother Wallace looked at him and said, well, which is worse, not kneeling down or peeping? Sometimes we bind some things that don't work too well. The posture ought to be of the Spirit. When we do bow our heads, or if we do kneel, physically speaking, it's because of a demonstration of the Spirit bowed to God in humble adoration. You see people a lot of times lifting up their hands and all this kind of thing. Well, I don't mind they will lift up their hands, but you don't have to. It's sort of like when we baptize somebody. You don't have to say a word. That is the person that's doing the baptizing in the baptistry. You don't have to say a word. Why then do we say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the mission? Why do we say it? To tell everybody out here watching it what I am doing and what this person is doing. If that person doesn't know what he gets in the water, my saying is not going to help him. You baptize people who are taught correctly and believe it. So when we say it, we're simply announcing what we're doing. Baptism scripturally is what we do. And that person must know what's going on before he ever gets in the water. I don't know that we say that or think about that enough because it's another custom. I'm not advocating breaking custom. I'm glad to continue with it and will do so. I'm just trying to say don't let customs become a thing that's binding. And sometimes people do. Quickly, I want to mention some things for which we are to pray. We're to pray for, for the forgiveness of one another's sins. Forgive our debts as we also Forgive our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. You can go on through, James 5, 16, 1 John, and so on. You see, that doesn't rule out the obligation of the sinner to repent and confess sins. It simply says when they do, here is the way that you operate as a faithful Christian. We certainly should be praying to God in time of great pain and anguish and temptation. We even are taught in the model prayer and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Matthew 6, 13. How's he going to do that? I don't know. He said do it, he'll do it. That's his business on that end of the fence. Matthew 6, 11, we're taught to pray for the necessities of life. I mentioned that. Give us this day our daily bread. 
We're taught to pray for earthly rulers and for the privilege of leading a quiet life as children of God in this world. Paul told Timothy he was to believe it and he was to teach it to the church as a preacher. For all men, he says, pray. For kings and all that are in high place. Why? That we may lead a quiet, American standards is tranquil and peaceful life in all godliness and gravity. 1 Timothy 2 and verse, verses 1 and 2. There's the instruction from God how to pray. We're to pray for the sick. I don't expect a miracle when I pray for the sick. That's setting aside God's natural law. But you know, all healing is divine. I didn't say it was miraculous. But all healing is divine. If you have some sort of disease and there's an antibiotic that'll kill the bug, it kills the bug when you take it, if all goes well. But your body heals itself. If you've got a, an appendix that's infected, they take it out, your body heals itself. That's divine healing. How so? God made it to do that way. And you can go on and on with that kind of thing. All modern science does is discover what's already been here. They could have removed a bad appendix a couple hundred years ago if they'd had the wherewithal to do it. Well, think about cataracts. That's the easiest surgery I ever had in my life, had cataracts removed. Well, it wasn't that many years ago. It was kind of an ordeal. They could do it, and then there was the time they couldn't do it at all. But if they could have, as they can now, through modern technology and discovery of things, then it would have worked, but the body still heals itself takes advantage of what man's done to replace what God put there in the first place. And think about this. Where did the people ever learn how to fix, to develop that part in your eye that they replace if they didn't have the model that God made? Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, James 5, 14. But I'm going to do that without expecting a miracle. And because I call the elders or it's announced from this pulpit, I'd like you to pray for me over a certain matter. And if I'm sick, that doesn't mean I'm not going to go see the doctor or doctors or what I can do to get help. We even to pray for our enemies, love your enemies. Pray for them that persecute you. Matthew 5, verse 44. Do you know what that means? Think of the people in Jerusalem at the time of Stephen's death and what Saul of Tarsus was doing to the church. Think of the people praying for him in the church that were praying for him. They were faithful. They did. Then pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he send forth the laborers in the harvest. Matthew 9, 38. And you can go on and on. The model prayer given by Christ gives us then an insight into prayer. Notice it's addressed. Father includes, I said earlier about this, it includes adoration. It includes supplication for the kingdom. It includes petitions for daily sustenance for forgiveness, for deliverance from the evil one, and an ascription of glory to God. Now, if you think of your prayers, whatever you're praying for, and see if it doesn't fall into one of those general categories. We, of course, don't pray for the kingdom to come. When Christ gave that model of prayer, the kingdom hadn't come, so he prayed, thy kingdom come. But it gives us the authority to pray for the spirit of the kingdom, for the strength of the kingdom, and we ought to recognize that. As I say, even though this took 30 minutes or so to do, you could spend a lot of time on each one of these points in your own life, and that's what's going to happen if you pray right, is you'll be studying about these things in your own life and how to incorporate it into your prayer to your Father. But begin by setting time out of day to, and during the day to pray. To begin with the model prayer. And to look at these things. And then just by 
as a Christian and all that being off Christ means as a member of the Lord's family, the church, think about all that's given to you. Do you ever thank God just to have been born in this country? Do you ever thank God just to have what you have? And by that I mean the freedom of religion. To pray for the leaders of the country that we lead a quiet and peaceful life. And all these things that you can pray. Now the Lord gave us these for our good, for our part in being faithful to him and getting us to heaven. Setting our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. But summing it all up, if you think about all these things and you engage in them regularly, look at the sense of dependence it creates in you on God. The closeness that it develops between the child and the father. Prayer will pull all of these things together. It will help you study better. It will help you be everything you ought to be. Because God answers prayer. And I don't have to worry about how he does it. I just need to be determined to do my part in studying and doing his will, a part of which is praying to God. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, I would beg of you, I would plead with you by the mercies of Christ to obey the gospel before you leave this building today, that you could have your sins forgiven, leave a child of God, acceptable to God, added to the church by the Lord, and then tonight before you go to bed, just before you drift off to sleep, you'll be able to know that when you say, My Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He hears you, and when you ask according to his will, he will bless you. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.